Hello everyone, and welcome to my presentation on Relations of the Dead, Use and Disuse of Ancient Egyptian Funerary Books at the 2021 Virtual Conference for Bibliographical and Book Studies hosted by the BSC. Going Forth by Day, or more famously known by its modern term, Book of the Dead, is a compilation of spells written on papyrus designed to guide the deceased into the afterlife and achieve rebirth through divine transfiguration. It served as the funerary rituals, recited by lecture priests before and during burial, subsequently being buried with the deceased and effectively going into disuse. Spell 148 states, this papyrus roll is a secret. Nobody is to know it. It is not to be told to anyone. No one is to see it. No ear is to hear it, except the owner and his teacher. Making it clear that the book's contents remain a mystery to the living. The secret knowledge of the spell is reserved solely for the dead. Most non-Egyptologists do not know, however, that the Book of the Dead belongs to a long-standing tradition and history of funerary literature, being only third in a vast series of guidebooks composed throughout ancient Egyptian history. Its predecessor was the coffin text, written on wooden coffins, which derived from the pyramid text, written on royal tomb walls. But regardless of which series, the objective of funerary literature and the books remained the same for millennia. Though these books went into disuse after burial, they continuously served a spiritual purpose through magic and divine affiliations. By challenging Western notions of the book and examining ancient Egyptian book culture through funerary literature and the role of magic in Egyptian ideology, it becomes apparent that the books that the funerary books state of disuse subsequently created an intangible form of book use agency. Looking to book historical scholarship first, I spent a great deal of time researching notions and definitions on the book because being trained in Egyptology long before book history, I could not comprehend why book historians were discarding stone inscriptions from being books simply because they are written on a mobile surface. When in Egypt, stone is a fundamental writing surface for literary works, and in Egyptology, Certain stone inscriptions are automatically considered books with no hesitation since they are literary works. I noticed the fundamental focus on portability as a defining characteristic for the book. As Thomas Folger, one amongst the many mobilists, as I like to call them, mentioned although the history of writing might have to include anything from the cave walls of Lascaux to ancient stele, our definition of the book must be narrowed to records in portable form. This statement confounded me because having also a background in medieval European studies and its manuscript production, this Western notion of portability becomes problematic and illogical even towards its own book culture, considering many missile codices are not really portable due to their size and weight, the fact that sacred manuscripts were first and foremost objects of veneration and were not meant to be portable, and the practice of ecclesiastical and academic libraries chaining books to lecterns which effectively immobilized them. So when looking into what constitutes a book for book historians based on the scholarship, I had to discard the standard definition since it is ultimately rooted in Western bias and early modern traditions, tailored specifically to materials available to Western cultures and thus towards Western book culture. The common definition that I found based on consistent notions is, folium with texts that are bound together many times covered by hard or soft materials. Now, while this definition can account for overlooked non-Western book mediums, such as palm leaves, bamboo, a variety of bark, and other materials, some of which this very work and analysis is being done at the University of Toronto with the Old Books New Science Lab, and as well as the definition centering on bibliography and materiality to understand the book, an important but seemingly overlooked field in book history and actually the reason why I developed this research in the first place due to the misconception of book culture in Egypt as being solely restricted to papyrus. The definition nevertheless is restricting because of the fundamental focus on portability and the codex, ultimately causing the neglect of mediums that do not take a codex form that are not leaf-like, such as stone, elements of the natural world like mountains or caves, wood, tablets of various materials, ostraca, and even papyrus, because although some sh although strips of papyri are technically bound together by natural glue seeping from the plant, it does not become a codex, but a scroll. 
And of course, such a definition completely ignores digital books since they are not tangible and therefore cannot assume any definitions based on materiality. The standard definition clearly demonstrates a seminal focus on the codex and thus portability. So in trying to figure out how to communicate the book in ancient Egypt in book historical terms, I realized that in general, when discussing the book in ancient cultures, the book cannot be defined by its medium, and therefore the book is not an object, but the text and or pictures on the object. While I also realize that it is commonplace for the book in the West to mean both the written text or the physical object rendering the text, the latter notion must be discarded as it places numerous restrictions on substrates from other book cultures since portable codex style mediums are the focal point. And in any case, considering all papyri to be books simply because papyrus is the material that renders the text is erroneous, since papyrus containing administrative matters are not books. So I came to the conclusion that the book is an idea, an idea which is then transposed textually and or pictorially onto a medium. And this by no means is a novel concept. Looking at the book as an idea rather than an object avoid the pre-associated bias of equating book to codex, as well as accounting for both tangible and intangible books. And it is unrestrictive towards book mediums because it essentially allows any substrate to function as a book carrier. And so the revised definition that I particularly enjoy is one mentioned by Eleanor Robson in A Companion to the History of the Book. The book is a means of recording and transmitting in writing or through pictures, a cultural's intellectual traditions. And I've added here or through pictures because a book need not be restricted to text as it can take on solely pictorial forms, especially in Egypt, since the Egyptian image in reality functions as a figurative script with a syntactic structure. And thus there are many examples of what we could call Egyptian book picture books. Another excellent synopsis for the meaning of the book that focuses on it being an idea was given by Brian Cummings. The book signifies something abstract, the words and the meanings collected within it. Even in its textual form, the book becomes more than itself, a visual representation not only of the contents within, but of the idea of the book altogether. And so again, the focus of what the book conveys metaphysically rather than physically. Moving now to Egyptological discourse, I will first begin by explaining some of the fundamentals of Egyptian funerary literature, its book culture, and the Egyptian ideologies. Now, Egyptian funerary literature is literary works found within tombs dealing with eschatology, primarily that which guided the deceased into the next life and live amongst the divine. It is a compilation of ritualistic spells designed to guide the deceased into the afterlife and achieve rebirth through transfiguration into an ak, the effective spirit. In terms of their literary composition, they are categorized under the Egyptian lyric, Jedef, and or narrative, Duau or Shkem E, due to their perform performative nature that involve reciting the spells with verbal force. And as previously mentioned, their primary use was to be read aloud by lector priests, male priests who recited spells and hymns at rituals and ceremonies before and during burial, serving as the funerary rituals. In terms of what are the funerary books of ancient Egypt, Egyptian funerary literature is comprised of three main texts. The pyramid text, which originated in the Old Kingdom, the coffin text, which originated in the first intermediate period, and the Book of the Dead, which originated in the New Kingdom. And again, these are all modern terms. There are many other funerary books composed during and after the New Kingdom, the main groups being, but not limited to, the Netherworld books and the Books of the Sky both which had their own subseries of books dealing with specific themes that originally appeared in the three main aforementioned funerary books, but discussed them in a more elaborate nature. Now I want to mention that although I've provided a neat linear outline on the types of funerary books, it is by no means comprehensive, nor is it the reality because the pyramid texts were still in use during the first intermediate period, spells from the coffin texts are seen in the Old Kingdom, and spells from the Book of the Dead are seen as far back as the Middle Kingdom. The outline is only here to serve as an introductory for the non-Egyptologist, but the historiography of these books is in fact quite complex. The pyramid texts are the first funerary book to be produced and was reserved solely for royal use. The texts appear at the end of the fifth dynasty in the burial chambers of King Unas. 
then in the tombs of kings and queens in the sixth dynasty. The literary work reveals considerable religious thought of the old kingdom and is one of the oldest religious texts in the world, thus viewed by some Egyptologists as religious literature because it alludes to mythology, theology, cosmology, cosmogony, and cultic associations. Funerary literature and, literary and religious literature are thus terms that are often used interchangeably due to the high degree of religion associated with the funerary sphere. And one of the most important things to know about this text, as its significance will be discussed later on in the presentation, is that the script is hieroglyphs, as well as the book's medium being stone. The coffin text appeared in the succeeding period after Egypt's central administration collapsed and a power shift occurred as nomarchs, the governors of Egypt's gnomes, or provinces, became exceedingly influential towards the end of the Old Kingdom. The socio-political history of this period becomes crucial in understanding the context of the coffin text because funerary literature now appears on the coffins of the elite. The spell is no longer being reserved for royal use. In Egyptology, this phenomenon is known as the democratization of the afterlife. Because the spells have become more widely available and because the achievement of the afterlife along with its benefits is no longer monopolized by royalty though monopolized by the upper class. This funerary book is particularly fascinating because now we see art being employed as accompanying visual text and the book containing another book within it, the Book of Two Ways, which essentially is a map showing the two routes a deceased can take to navigate the underworld, one on land and one on water. And it is seen in this image with the black and blue wavy lines on the right side of the coffin. And again, one of the most important things to know about this text is that the script is cursive hieroglyphs as well as the book's medium being wood. The Book of the Dead appears about 600 years after the first coffin text, in which the afterlife has now become fully democratized as the spells were available to anyone who could afford to copy them or have them copied. The book was not standardized until almost a thousand years after its inception and was used until the end of Pharaonic Egypt meaning until Egypt became a Roman province. We see that rubrics are being employed, although rubrication is seen earlier on in some coffins with the coffin text. They're used here to denote titles, additional comments about the spell's effectiveness, or for specific instructions on their use. And again, one of the most important things to note is that the script is cursive hieroglyphs, as well as the book's medium being papyrus. Now I want to make it clear that while the purpose of these three funerary books is the same, and while the contents of the coffin text does derive off of the pyramid text and the Book of the Dead derives off of its predecessors, such does not mean that the content of the books are unanimously the same. There's extensive variation amongst these three funerary books, even within themselves, as not one single edition or copy is identical. Also, the coffin text provided additional spells not seen in the pyramid text was while discarding spells of its predecessor, and the Book of the Dead did the same. Moreover, their medium is by no means restricted to those discussed except for the pyramid text. The funerary books can be found on other objects from the mortuary sphere, as sections of the coffin text are seen on papyri, tomb walls, mummy masks, canopic chests, statues, and stele, and chapters of the Book of the Dead are found on wooden coffins, stone sarcophagi, tomb and temple walls, and on Shopti figures, which are small statuettes made of faience, which is glazed ceramic. And so again, I want to reiterate that Egypt's book culture was not solely restricted to papyrus, as there were many other book mediums in play, and some used even more so than papyrus. Now, understanding Egypt Egyptian ideology is seminal to understanding Egyptian book culture, especially with funerary books and how they functioned in both their use and disuse. Looking first to concepts on death and the afterlife, the Egyptians viewed death as a process of transfiguration and rebirth. All those who lived their life morally by upholding ma'at, the governing concept of Egyptian society, which can be translated as cosmic harmony or justice, by upholding the central tenet, they would be reborn in the afterlife. The goal of funerary rituals was therefore to ensure immortality after death by performing rites that allowed the deceased spirit to be reborn, existing in both the terrestrial and spiritual planes. And funerary books reinforced this goal, which became eternalized through their physical presence in the tomb, 
invoking cyclical renewal of the deceased due to its permanence. In terms of Egyptian ideologies on magic in relation to the funerary books, the hieroglyphic, the hieroglyphic script and curse of hieroglyphs, since it is a subgroup of the script, plays a crucial role due to its perceived divinity. The term used to denote hieroglyphs in Egyptian was medu nature, words of God, evidently influencing the Greek term known today, hieroglyphica, meaning sacred carved writing. And therefore the written word had magic, magical potency because since the hieroglyphic script was attributed to the divine, it was seen as a living entity endowed with divine power especially since it was associated with the god of wisdom, Thoth, who is also patron deity of scribes and thus by association patron deity of writing. The script originally was used to commemorate the divine or the king as seen during Egypt's formative years and then moved to commemorating all the deceased in the old kingdom. Since the spells of the funerary books were first and foremost recited as part of the funerary rituals, speaking also invoked magic. To speak was viewed as a process of creation because it was one of the primary tools of Ptah, one of Egypt's various creator gods. The Ak also related to the primordial god Hu, seen as the personification of divine utterance. And related to Hu is Heka, another primordial god and the personification of magic. He reflects the close link between Egyptian magic and the word, whether spoken or written. And on a mortal level, it was with the help of Heka that caused the spoken word to come to life. The spoken word of lector priests was particularly imbued with magic since they were the principal magicians and the holders of the sacred knowledge of the funerary books. So in understanding some of the Egyptian ideologies on death, magic, and even the divine, it comes to no surprise that the funerary books effectively became active agents when they were no longer in physical use and the tomb sealed. The book's disuse created agency upon the space of the tomb because the written word was a vehicle for sacred power representing the creative force to maintain life. Filling hieroglyphs with green paint, the color of regeneration to the Egyptians, reinforced this belief, and thus its physical existence created agency through the fact that it was perceived to be living, and thus continually reenacting the spells that allowed for the deceased to exert their immortal nature. Speaking as well activated the spells for eternity so the deceased could be provided with the underworld equivalent of what was spoken. The deceased spirit was clearly believed to resurrect daily, modeled after the cyclical rebirth of the sun. But in order to accomplish such, they needed the spells from these funerary books. One of the most famous and crucial rituals from these funerary books, the opening of the mouth, is a ritual performed on the mummy or the statue of the individual that gave the deceased their senses again. Since the ritual effectively allowed the spirit of the deceased to see, speak, hear, breathe, and more importantly, receive offerings of food and drink, the ritual allowed the Ba, the deceased manifested spirit, to travel throughout the day, while the Ka, the life force of the deceased, was then able to engage in the offering spells so as to be eternally replenished. Pictorial and textual representations in the tomb eternalized this ritual, ensuring that the deceased would continuously receive their senses to participate in the world of the living. Through their utterance and physical inscription, such books not only allowed the deceased to achieve rebirth, but also protected the tomb from terrestrial evil. There are numerous spells on protecting the tomb from dangerous animals, desecration, robberies, and even protecting the body specifically so it does not perish. Hieroglyphs that depict dangerous animals were sometimes shown as being mut mutilated to ensure protection, as well as defeat over isfet, chaos. So there is even agency noted through the magical symbolism behind the stylistic composition of the hieroglyphic script. Funerary books clearly not only lived in the physical terrestrial realm, but in the metaphysical spiritual realm. Certain spells were in fact meant to be recited by, by the deceased, demonstrating that while the spoken word was just as important as the written word, it did not act in its place because certain spells required a physical existence for their metaphysical use as it was the deceased who needed to recite and employ them on their journey through the underworld. So in sum, 
Funerary books fundamentally transformed the space of the tomb by bringing it to life through the spells that activated the various components of the Egyptian body and protected the burial. Such was accomplished through the sacredness of the hieroglyphic script and speaking the funerary text aloud. Spiritual agency caused by an everlasting divine or magical force. These books played a crucial role in Egyptian culture and ideology because without their spells, the deceased could not transfigure into an ak the effective spirit, and achieve the afterlife, and they therefore ensured a successful transition into the next world. And so the use of these funerary books, their recitation, activated their agency, but their disuse, their burial in the tomb, is what eternalized it. Thank you.